proud to be able to host this collaborative program with AGAR uh, with assistance from the Sweetbriar College and the Monica Nation and the NACP. So we're very um, delighted that we could put on the program as well as this wonderful exhibit, um, the exhibit called Women Making a Difference, 1920 to 2020. Um, there is this incredible wall of women in the exhibit, and that is mainly responsible to Donna Meeks. Donna, would you raise your hand? She has done an incredible job putting it together, and you'll just, you, you'll walk in and it's like family, as one of the visitors said last week, it's family. So thank you all for coming out this evening, and I'm going to turn the program on over to um, Lynn Cable from Agar. Thank you. I'm so happy to see you all this afternoon, and I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna get out of here pretty fast because it's a pretty tight program. So welcome, welcome, and Eleanor, would you would you come up, please? This is Reverend Eleanor Rose. And she's going to start the program by reading a poem by Sojourner Truth called Ain't I a Woman. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is a blessing to be here today. And I'm doing the lead for Ms. Edith Johnson, a peer, Edith Jones, a pioneer. So many wonderful things about her life. So I'm going to start out with Ain't I a Woman. That man over there say, a woman needs to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me a best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get to it and bear the lashes as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold into slavery. And when I cried out in mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? That little man in black there say, a woman can't have much rights as a man. Because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. If the first woman God, God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, together, women ought to be able to turn it right side up again. You see, my story remembers, remains when in 2008, we were getting ready for the upcoming election and we were in Miss Edith Jones' house, and she did not want to vote absentee. She was stern. She wanted to vote at the courthouse. So we got her ready and she went, and at that time she was 104 years old. She was determined to vote for Barack Obama. She was so proud. Mrs. Jones, I know there's a lot going to be said about it, had cast her vote, and she was 107 years old. God bless you all and have a blessed day. League's vice president, who happened to be a Lynchburg resident, Elizabeth Lewis, visited that part of Amherst County. Founding officers there were Callie Mundy Henley. Thank you, Donna, for giving me the initials. All I knew her was Mrs. C.M. Henley. Callie Mundy Henley, president. Eleanor Floyd Turner, vice president. And Louise Cavill, secretary treasurer. They had eight members in 1915. The Equal Suffrage League and its local chapters work steadily, week after week, month after month, holding meetings, sponsoring conferences, marching in parades, lobbying legislators, gathering signatures for petitions, and writing letters of advocacy. It was an uphill battle, year after year, but they never gave up. My second point, although we think of suffragists today as liberal progressive women, most local suffragists in the 19 teens were conservative. Despite advocating for what was considered a radical belief at the time, most Virginia suffragists held very traditional views about culture and race. 
The matriarch of the woman suffrage movement in Lynchburg, a woman named Elizabeth Langer Lewis, exemplifies this pattern. She was a lifelong Democrat, at the time the conservative political party. She was a devout, pro-Confederate, lost cause Southern sympathizer, and yet she was also a passionate and eloquent leader in what was one of the most unsouthern of causes. As ultimate proof of this conservatism, we can look at the results of the 1920 presidential election, the first one in which women could vote. Lynchburg and Amherst County voted overwhelmingly for the Cox-Roosevelt Conservative Democrat Party ticket by a three to one margin in the city and by a four to one margin in the county. Only a very small percentage of white women voted against the conservative Democratic ticket. One local woman's response to a Lynchburg news poll suggested suggest the strong culture of conservatism that prevailed in Central Virginia. When she was asked how she would vote before the election, she replied, quote, a Southern woman has got no business being anything but a Democrat, adding that, quote, she could not believe that Lynchburg harbored, her word, a single Republican white woman, unquote. For some white suffrage leaders, the exclusion of black women was strategic, since one of the chief arguments against women's suffrage, especially in the South, was that it, it would enfranchise more African Americans and threaten the existing socio-political order. However, we must also acknowledge that many white suffragists in Virginia, and in fact the entire country, held what we consider racist and white supremacist beliefs. They were products of their time who could fight on high principles of equality with men and at the same time consider women of color inferior and unworthy of that same equality. Of course, many African Americans and indigenous people supported women's suffrage, but felt the best way to ensure success was to lay low, keep quiet, and work for suffrage behind the scenes. My third and last point, significant barriers to voting existed in 1920 and continued well into the 20th century. Voting was not easy and certainly not democratic in 1920. The long journey of women's suffrage did not end with the 19th Amendment or with the presidential election of 1920. Consider how women had to register to vote in 1920. First, they had to go to the town of Amherst to get an official poll tax assessment or what they called a bill in the office of the Commissioner of the Revenue. Then they had to pay their poll tax of $1.50 in the office of the county treasurer. Both of these were in the town of Amherst, so if you live far away, this was a journey. Then they actually had to register to vote by going back to their local neighborhood, finding their precinct's registrar at either his workplace or residence, and show him the poll tax receipt. Once there, they had to pass a literacy test by filling out a registration form in their own handwriting. By state law, by the state constitution, the registrar was not required to offer you any assistance to answer your questions, to answer any of the questions on the form. If you put an answer in the wrong spot or if you left a question blank, the registrar could discard your application and you would not be able to vote. Finally, you had to answer under oath and in writing, quote, any and all questions affecting your qualifications as a voter. This was to be asked completely at the discretion of the registrar, and this is what we now know as a citizenship test. Questions like what article the Constitution discusses the judiciary. Elizabeth Lewis, Lynchburg's leader of suffrage, wrote in a letter to the editor of the Lynchburg News, this provision is not in the nature of a college entrance exam, as some women are being told, but it is a simple measure meant to ascertain the literacy of the voter. If men can stand the test, surely women can. As you can imagine, the process of registering to vote was a challenging gauntlet that many women and men, especially people of color and the working classes, either did not attempt or were not able to complete if they started. In Amherst County, the first woman who qualified to register to vote by paying her poll tax was Sally Carter Whitehead, 39-year-old wife of the attorney Thomas Whitehead, a mother of two, who lived in the town of Amherst. The first two women to actually register to vote in the county were number one, Roberta Pendleton Harrison, 46-year-old wife of Robert Harrison, a banker who lived near the town of Amherst. And number two, Bessie Walker Robertson, a 35-year-old woman who lived on Main Street in the town of Amherst with her 80-year-old mother, Martha Robertson. The Lynchburg newspaper reported that as of noon on October 2nd, 1920, this was the final day of the deadline that women could register to vote in Virginia, that in the courthouse precinct, so not the entire county, but just the courthouse precinct of Amherst, 82 white women and one black woman had registered to vote. 
Unfortunately, the one black woman mentioned in the article was not identified. The other, of course, we know the first two, Roberta Harrison and Bessie Robertson. Does anybody know who that first woman of color was to register in Amherst? Anybody? If it's not in the paper, I don't know how on earth we will, we will know, unless maybe a family has a story about it, just because there are so few records about suffrage and voting from this period. Just to give you some comparison, there were an estimated 2,200 eligible women in the county of Amherst. So we had somewhere between maybe 80 and 100 registered out of 2,200. Clearly, there were significant barriers for women to vote in Amherst in 1920, economic, cultural, and practical. I'll close with just a few thoughts. There are countless museum exhibits open right now about the women's suffrage movement. Uh, please take time to visit them. There's a great one here at the Amherst County Museum. We will open another one in the Lynchburg Museum downtown later this fall. There's a great one in Richmond at the Library of Virginia, and there are several in Washington, D.C. if you make it that far. There's a great one at the Library of Congress and at the National Archives. In the last essay that civil rights leader John Lewis wrote before he died, Lewis paraphrased Ronald Reagan's famous statement that, quote, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It has to be fought for and defended by each generation. Lewis wrote, quote, democracy is not a state, it is an act, and each generation must do its part to help build a nation at peace with itself. You must use the right to vote because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. Thank you. If anyone wants to read more of Mr. Delaney's work on suffrage, he has an article out in Lynch's Ferry, a journal of local history. Uh, it's a lovely article, and read it if you have a chance. The next speaker is Donna Meeks, who's a resident of Amherst County, and also has, are you a resident of Nelson County now, or did you used to be? I guess I've been in Amherst longer than I have been in Nelson. Okay, okay, you've, you've gone, gone across both counties. Uh, she's also a member of the Agar Board, and she's done more research than she thought possible on the family and community ties that link the members of the Galt's Mill Equal Suffrage Chapter. Uh, Donna, could you tell us a little bit about what you found? I really don't have anything prepared, um, but I just wanted to um, thank you for some of the information that, that, that I never came across, so I would love to collaborate a little bit. One of the things that spurred me to do this was um, obviously it was the, the 100 year anniversary. And um, I thought, is there anything happening, or was there anything happening in, in Amherst County? COVID had hit, and so I got my cousin, who lives in Richmond, to go to the museum. And because I had at least found that there was some information about Amherst County. And so she came up with two pieces of paper. And you'll see them in the museum. They're typewritten, poor copies, and all the information on those two sheets is the number of members that the Golf Mill and the Amherst um, um, Equal um, Suffrage League chapters um, had. It tells you the officers, and it tells you the date that basically they started. That was it. Some of the, so it was sometimes so in love, I didn't even quite pick up one of the names, Henley, um, until I really had to look closely. So I was going from these uh, photocopies of these these badly, you know, typewritten reports, and that was it. That's all that I had. Well, if anybody knows me, I, I have this dogged determinist, determination that, you know, really is, is sometimes a pain. <laughs> And I immediately started doing my research. And I guess to end all my conversation with you is just to say that I think each and every one of us is kin to each other in some way. <laughs> because every time I started figuring out this puzzle of all these people, I began to realize they're all connected. You know, they're connected through marriage. They're connected through blood. In fact, there was one family that I found no connection. I was like, it was Mrs. E.J. Turner. Her family was the one that was uh, basically the last the owners of the, uh, the Galt's Mill complex. And um, 
So last night, just something, you know, I was like, well, I, I better double check this because three hours of research, I found a connection. <laughs> and it was to the Garland family. I was just, I was just amazed. So, you're from the, well, you populated Amherst County, that's all I can say. Um, so, at any rate, part of my research is, is not so much about maybe what these women actually did in the suffrage movement, because we don't have any information. Um, what my whole point was is to find out really where these women came from. You know what they're what from for four generations. You know how how did they all come together and meet in Amherst and suddenly become this active group in this type of movement in a, a very conservative South. And so that's those are the types of things that I've um, d discovered about these families. So um, I hope I hope you en enjoy the exhibit and um, everything that it has to do with it. Thank you. My husband and I came, moved to Amherst County took a job teaching at um, Sweetbriar College in 1965 and one of the first things we did was to register to vote and so what we did is we went to a lady's house in Amherst and we walked up the steps to her porch and we knocked on the door and she answered the door we said we wanted to register to vote and she took us into her living room and we sat down and we had a nice little talk about this and that and everything else and then we registered to vote. I am glad my husband was there with me and that um, I was somewhat comfortable doing it. I can imagine where there were many people who would not have been quite so comfortable to do, to do that kind of thing. The um, League of Women Voters in Lynchburg got going again after the Second World War in 1957. And at that time, there were eight members from, um, mostly from Sweetbriar College, Jane Belcher, Gladys Spoon, Laura Buckingham, Helen McCone, Elizabeth Muncy, Louisa Smith, and Jean Louise Williams. Another member that uh, from Amherst that was um, in the league was Dr. Carol Wright. She served Rice Rice. She served on the um, board of directors and was chair of the Nash, the, lo the local chair of the national issue on mental health and election laws. The League is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support candidates. We do not support political parties. We do support issues. And we support those issues after we've studied them for a long, long, long time. Uh, and then we can act on those issues. When, um, in the 60s and 70s, we had unit meetings. Those unit meetings met in people's homes. They, we would present the findings of our studies, discuss them, and then support a statement that state of what we believed, and then we could act on that statement. We were after issues that um, could be affected through the legislature and the political process. If we were concerned about hunger, we would look towards legislation. We were not organizing food banks, kind, kinds of things. Um, and that is that has changed. That has changed. Uh, I think we were also a chance for women who were mostly at that time denied access to certain jobs and were expected at home, as I was. I was a a strong or a busy volunteer most of my life. I spent a few years teaching special education in Pleasant View and Temperance, but mostly I was at home. 
And it prepared women to go out then and be elected and uh, serve on state boards and local boards and was a training ground in um, that way. The, um, another thing, if you go look through our records, so in 19, uh, the 60s, I was Mrs. John R. McLennan, parentheses Molly. <laughs> then in the 70s and 80s, I became Molly McLennan, parentheses, Mrs. John McLennan. <laughs> now I am just plain Molly McLennan. <laughs> I, I think that's good. We, I talked about the issues, and we were interested in almost everything. We still are interested in almost everything. And you know, you can get so interested in so many things that you're not effective in anything. And what we have done is we have come more back to issues of voting. So while we have all these statements about things and principles we believe in, we are really acting on elections and and votings. Um, one of the things we did locally and then it became uh, adopted by the um, State League of Women of Voters is to work in the area of the restoration of rights for felons. It used to be very, very difficult. You were, you were a violent or a nonviolent felon. You had to have letters of recommendations. You had to wait a certain amount of time. You, have to have, you would have had to pay all your fees and all your assessments and this kind of thing. And then the governor would decide whether you were worthy of getting your vote restored. This is in the state constitution that the governor has sole authority on restoring rights. Um, now it is much, much easier. You have to have finished your incarceration. You have to successfully have completed your supervised part of your pro probation or sentence. And not the whole sentence, the part where you're supervised, and then you have more sentence sometimes for good behavior kinds of things. And then you can apply and have your uh, rights restored. And in fact, um, over several of our more recent governors have restored many, many rights. So our advice to people who have lost their right to vote is to check first and see if maybe it's already been restored. So we're big on pamphlets and trifolds, and I brought some of these, so if any of you are interested in the current situation on the right to vote, you can um, study that. In 2011, the League of Women Voters of Virginia and several other organizations sponsored a competition among college students to redraw district lines. And um, there were a number of entries. There were two entries from William and Miriam, William and Mary. They, I went to the event where they all the, uh, where the displays were and where the winners were chosen. And these women, people from William and Mary were so excited and so loud and so ready to engage you in this drawing of the lines. And we have formed at about that time, with help from Shannon Valentine and uh, former Lieutenant Governor Bowling, the One Virginia 2021. And this is an organization that wanted to change the way Virginia draws its lines, which we have to do, as you know, every 10 years after the census. It was a complicated process because it required an amendment to the Constitution. I'm sure you all know it passed, two years ago it passed this fall. There was an election in between and now it's going to be on the ballot. Um, there was a time that 
we don't know, there was a time when, well, let's just, whoever is in, in power and has the ability to draw those lines is sometimes less enthusiastic about change than they might be otherwise when the lines were drawn for them. So we are working really, really hard because if you care about for fair government, this is the way to go. It would set up a commission of um, two Republicans, two, two Democrats from the House, two from the Republicans, two Democrats from the Senate. That would be eight and then eight citizens and they would draw the lines. They present it to the legislature. The legislature could approve it or not approve it. They could try again, but the legislature could not change it and then it would go to the Supreme Court. So you all have a chance to um, make your voice known on that issue as well. Um, so that got started by getting a lot of people together. I think I'd like to tell you about one other project that I was involved in and that has been very rewarding, and that is the development of the Blackwater Creek trails and stream valleys. We had some members, one in particular, who had a vision of a trail system in Lynchburg. We started out with a study of where the parks and recreations were in the city, and then we saw where this could be. And we, we organized a meeting that included environmentalists, historians, garden clubs, women's groups, the city government all, and it was before the centennial, so the city was looking for a project. And by bringing those groups together, they, people got behind the idea and then they took it and it accomplished. But it was, a, it, it's been rewarding to me because it, so many different people fed into it, but it did take saying, let's get together and do something about it. So, um, and I, I felt it was fair to mention it to you all because you have developed trails here in Amherst County and now there's the bridge between Amherst and Nelson County that is uh, exciting, I think. Thank you. Next speaker is, is Diane Shields, who is a member of the Monacan Nation and is a genealogist, historian, and activist. She is the co-author with Karen Woods of the Monacan Nation, Our Story. The Monacan people did not share in the benefits of the ratification of the 19th Amendment and were prevented from voting in multiple ways. Diane? As you know, I worked with Karen Wood, a um, beautiful lady. She was a, she was a Monacan poet. She was a gracious lady like then. And it's called Hard Times. It says, a woman sets on a porch of weathered boards, her skin the color and texture of the dried apple dolls that grandmothers used to give their children years ago. When asked about the past, she will not speak. They were hard times. Maybe she sets on the parched earth instead, looks towards fields of cotton, sugar cane, or tobacco. Maybe she wears a printed house dress or sarong with hair covered or plaited, her face etched in memories of joy, snatched for her in daylight and auctioned to strangers. Her hands have scrubbed cities of floors, washed the nameless dead, cooked food for armies, so little of it's hers. Hands that failed to protect her or any of her children. She believes that if she speaks, she might break apart. The dust of her flying across stooped men chained by their debts to the fields. She presses both lips together, an effort to hold her own grief in her skin. Maybe evening wears into night, the stars that connect us gather like sisters around her. We hear they, they were hard times across the continuous land of our women until as sun rises above droning flies and the careless chickens, a voice speaks in our old language, which we do not know. We sift through history with dust on our hands, the empty rocker creaking in the breeze. 
It's all about how strong our women are. And it continues today. Thank you. Last is Gloria Witt, who is the founder and CEO of Define Success Coaching and is the president of the Amherst branch of the NAACP, which organized this summer's rally for social justice after the killing of George Floyd. She credits young people as being the impetus for this rally. Gloria? Good afternoon. Um, I, uh, when asked to participate in this forum, I'm like, you know, uh, okay, uh, historical activism and uh, women's suffrage. And so I reflected on that topic and um, I ended up coming up with like four questions that I wanted to share. And in that questioning process, I will address uh, the work that we're doing at the, uh, with NAACP locally. And as Marsha said, uh, we struggled with the idea of the March for Liberty here in the county because it is so conservative. But the young people uh, within the group, there's about uh, 60 plus uh, members on the roster and there's about 20 or so active uh, members who participate monthly in our meetings. And out of that, about four hot shots decided that something needed to be done. And I'm so grateful for them because it gave us a chance to redefine the moments of how we engage with Amherst County. So as I reflected back on what I would like to share with you today, I, the first question that came to my mind is, if I think about women in 1920 and suffrage, what were the issues of the day that created the space for activism? And I'm filtering it through the lens of, of black women. And so when I think about that lens, I think about what was happening. It, we were fighting for women's rights uh, with abolition, uh, get off of slavery. We were uh, engaged in anti-lynching -lynch conversations to stop that uh, a horrific act. We were talking about uh, really protecting our families. White mob violence was happening. Education was a struggle. Jobs was a struggle. And child care was an issue. And then I said to myself, well, okay, so we're talking about activism. So you know, when I really think about activism, it's almost as though that's the pollination of social justice. Because without activism, really nothing changes. Protest is at the heart of democracy. And, um, and, and through that pollination, you know, flowers bloom when we vote. So voting is so important uh, because it reflects our views and our desires for our community, state, and country. And um, as our, our previous speaker said, women are, take care of the heart of the community, is what I like to think. A lot of times men worry about the finances and the quote business, but the humanity piece of our community, it filters through the hearts of women. And uh, it was true then and it's true today. Um, Mr. Delaney shared this, this, this battle to get uh, the 19th Amendment passed. Uh, when I was doing some research, it was more than 72 years for these women to work to get the act, the 19th Amendment passed. And that suggests to us that change doesn't happen as a one-time event. It's a long-term commitment. I had someone ask me about marching and uh, the social justice and how do we make progress. And I said, it's not a one-night stand. It's not gonna happen overnight. And one march down Main Street will not change anything. It's a beginning and you just keep pounding at it and pounding at it until change happens. My second question I ask is, were, what were, the, were, were some historical figures of black monarch, uh, matriarchs of suffrage? Two women came to my mind, that I, and one, um, Pastor Rose, uh, Elna Rose shared short, Sojourner Truth. She was reading my mind, and I, she was so powerful for me because basically in about three minutes, she confronted this ideology that women could not do what a man can do. Ain't I a woman? And more importantly, she framed it from the perspective of a black woman because many times this thing was about white women. And she took that moment, she literally grabbed that moment 
uh, as they were talking around her. In about three minutes, she made a powerful point that women can do what men can do. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, uh, I'd like to say thank you. The other one is Ida B. Wells, and there's a connection there because she was a founding member of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and that really kind of tied together uh, the black women's suffrage movement for us. Um, as the historian has shared, Mr. Delaney, uh, we didn't hear any mention of a black women's club in Amherst County. I doubt if there was. Heads down and let's get the work done and survive. Uh, and she also, Ida B. Wells Barnett, uh, was a uh, founding member of the NAACP, which founded in 1909. It's an interracial civil rights organization. So I always like to mention that because a lot of people uh, shy away from it because it, quote, it's a black thing. It's not a black thing. Social justice is a people thing that has a shared interest in making change happen. But more importantly, uh, Ida B. Wells also uh, started the crusade about anti-lynching and anti-lynching from the horrific activities that was taking place. She painted vivid pictures of the impact of that act and together change happened and it didn't help that she owned a newspaper and had the tools in which to get the word out. So that's my historical uh, thought about black women's suffrage. Uh, the next thing I wanted to share was what were some of the lessons we've learned from the past? If we go back through uh, what people have written and, and, and the information that we have uh, when it comes to women's suffrage. First thing, women cannot do it alone. It, it takes all of us together to make change happen, connected by a common mission of ideas of what our society and nation should look like. Uh, the other thing that comes through is people in power, and people with privilege, must believe somewhere in their heart that a rising tide lifts all boats. Change the room you're in to make change happen. A lot of times we look out for, for change to happen, but we really gotta look in the mirror at ourselves. What can we do? to make change happen, particularly when it comes to social justice movements. Uh, you got to speak up. And, and the new buzzwords in society now is you have to practice anti-racist uh, behavior. And that means you have to say something when something is not right. You can no longer keep your mouth closed because silence is complicit. You, we got to get to know different people. These women who work together to make this change happen, they, they, won't, they were not making change happen in the kitchen or the church. They were in the streets. We have to stay engaged and open our doors for different ideas, expand the voices in the room, and create the inclusive co uh, community that we want. Um, the third thing is there is room for all who wants to engage. Whether you're educated or illiterate, there's space for you when it comes to so social justice and addressing our issues. And what that means practicing civic engagement, volunteering, speaking up, and more importantly, vote, vote, vote. And I cannot, uh, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the reckoning that's taking place right now. Um, in, in social justice. And the birthplace of it is actually uh, this uniquely American thing called slavery that lasted 300 years. And it was a history of brutality and torture and rape of black people. That's our roots. Welcome to America. And we got to deal with that. And not as a handicap, but as a reckoning that we didn't start at the same place at the same time. So 300 years of slavery, 155 plus years of freedom, but somewhere right after that 13th Amendment, I think they let us, they, 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 they uh, allowed us freedom. Um, they started using the vote and the legislative process to create racist laws to control and oppress black people uniquely, and as we've also known, our Native Americans. So, 
What does that mean? We've got systematic racism. Last week or so, I heard somewhere that there's no such thing as systemic racism. And I would be remiss not to deal with that. Systematic racism comes from intentional, methodical laws, legislators, legislative processes and rules that hail black people back. Things like Jim Crow, redlining, and employment, education discrimination, all those little practices that were embedded in our systems. Systematic racism. So what is systemic racism? It's the aftermath. It's the inherent behaviors that we kind of like, it's normal. That's what we do. That's, it, you know, it, it's, all, it's almost as though it's an unconscious, automatic response that our brain has done. It's neither, well, let's put it this way. It's not a shameful thing. It's not a guilt thing. It's the way our brains have been wired with unconscious bias. And until we as Americans begin to address our natural defaults to do what we've always done, then we'll keep getting the results of systemic racism. And I'll just highlight one place that takes a place right today. Oh, it can, it's, the laundry list is long. Employment discrimination. You take two people, exact same education, and statistics show us that the black person is two times more likely not to get the job. That's, right. That's real. It's not a host. It's real. Good people making good decisions on automatic pilot. You got to do something different. You got to get out of your comfort zone for people with privilege and for people with power. And when I say power, I'm talking about people who can make decisions and change who shows up in the room. Those are the type of, of things we need to, to be dealing with today. Uh, and finally, um, let's see. So those are my lessons from the past. And, and I hate to get preachy, but as you, I'm hoping you get, I'm passionate about this. Third question, what are some areas in the past that intersect today? Well, uh, today our mission in NAACP um, and our local branch has been around probably close to 70 years. Nancy, about 70 years, right here in Amherst County. And uh, so we've always been on the job although in the back room. Uh, our, our, our focus today is access to jobs, a quality education, and access to capital, housing, and of course we're always trying to get people registered to vote. It sounds so similar to what I started this conversation out with. So as Martin Luther King said, the art of moral change is long, and, but it always leads toward justice. That's kind of what he said. The point is, it's been a long time, and the conversations are similar. Uh, today, our, le our lynching has converted itself to co criminal justice reform and policing reform, and the spirit and the spark behind this conversation, I give, we give credit to Black Lives Matter. It's not a rogue organization, it's not a bunch of thugs, it's young people black, white, and all colors, raising the issue through activism. Yes, there's some violence that's happening. We're credited to human nature. But the point is, let's not lose the issue here. These things are happening today, and George Floyd was the 21st lynching with a knee on the neck. Let's accept that, because it's real. Voting today, just last week I read in the paper, we're down in Florida, Federal Circuit Georgia's judges decided to uphold the law that they put in place that basically says ex-felons can no longer vote unless you pay all your fines and da-da-da-da-da. Let's flip it back to 1920 in poll tax taxes. It's real. And it's, it's all done through the power of our vote who we vote for matters if we own this idea of our ideas and values for our community. It's a powerful tool, it's all we have, and we've got to use it with purpose. 
And finally, uh, child care has ra risen its head again uh, thanks to COVID. We got an issue with child care. It's expensive. The people who do the work don't get paid a living wage. In fact, most of these essential workers right now in COVID, uh, the, the cover has been open. They're not getting paid a living wage. Uh, and we need to work on what is a living wage. One thing that drives me crazy is when they say, oh, people of color got more, more of them are working than ever before. And I always counter with, and how much are we paying them? Is it a job with dignity or a check mark for you? Mm -hmm. We've got to pay people a living wage so they can work with dignity, dignity and take care of their families. So that's the work. In closing, uh, our work is not finished. Voting gives voice to what we value and who best represent our ideas. Uh, our matriarchs in the past understood the power of the vote to improve our communities and our daily lives. It upholds our democracy. It makes us a citizen. And we too must vote to endorse institutional systems that sustains or improves our lives or vote to remove barriers that, um, that, that stops uh, uh, barriers, that create barriers for us and others unselfishly. We have to vote for the greater good of our society, our local county, our state, and our country. Voting matters. And what, I'll stay, stop right there. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Molly McClain, uh, you talked about uh, the amendment that's going to be on the ballot this fall, and I understand how uh, the eight people from Congress, there'll be uh, four Democrats and four Republicans. I question how are they, ch how are they chosen, and how are the uh, eight citizen members decided the legis the legislators are chosen by the leadership within the house and the senate they are appointed by the the two the leadership there and the citizens are chosen by a panel i believe of retired judges that um and the work that is being done is to ensure that that process is open and fair and there's an application, application process. I don't think any of us would, would pretend that the amendment is perfect, but it certainly, in my opinion, is better than what we have at the present time. So do you think it would result in more fair uh, drawing of the line? Yes, I do. We didn't hear much about the last time in 2011 because one chamber was controlled by one party and the other chamber was con controlled by the other party. So they just agreed to stay out of each other's business. Um, people come into this with passion from very different reasons. I have, I, I believe that when we are in areas where everybody is the same, it is very easy to get extreme and that we're better off when we have a mixture and we have to talk to each other and understand each other. That is why I'm interested in districts that are not all Republican or all Democrat. Ms. Shields, um, <coughs> since you had the federal recognition, I wanted to ask how that has uh, affected the, the political participation of the young women of the Monaghan tribe. Well, I think it's made us all aware of how much more involved we need to be. Um, 
each one at different ages has to decide that for themselves. But federal recognition has been a real enlightenment and education, trying to understand the guidelines for federal that the federal government gives us. So, mm -hmm. I'm essentially just feeling a need to know where to go, how to participate. I now living in a very white world at Westminster Canterbury, a very privileged world, and also at the moment a very enclosed world. <laughs> but I feel that I have, I don't know where to go to just talk with people who have the same interests I do, but happen to have different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice on just broadening my life? I'm not too old to do some of that. <laughs> I would say prior to COVID-19, uh, my advice would have been to um, volunteer at some organization uh, that will give you access to different cultures. With COVID-19, I would just say it all starts with raising our consciousness and learning. And whose job is it to teach us as adults 